Hello? Is this Janet? Is this on? Ah, okay, got it. Okay, are we all here? Hopefully. All right. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're so pleased to have everyone uh, gathering again in our space. Um, my name is Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Elrich Museum. And on behalf of myself and my colleagues, some of whom you've seen around, Ranjit, Jana, Carolyn, Joe, um, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's talk by artist Annabelle Dow whose sound piece uh, titled Declaration is currently installed in Grace Memorial Chapel here on campus as part of our museum's ongoing Ulrich Connections series. We're very grateful to the Radigan Student Center for partnering with us on that project. And if you haven't been to Grace Memorial Chapel yet, I would strongly encourage you to go there like everything we do, it's free and open to everybody. And the chapel is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. So if you have, you know, a few minutes, 20 minutes after this event, you could just mosey on over on a beautiful evening there. Um, Annabelle Dow was born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon, and currently lives in New York City. In her own words, her work takes place at the intersection of writing, speech, and nonverbal modes of communication. Her paper-based constructions, audio and video works, and performances explore the expressive possibilities of ordinary language and reveal intimacies between individual and collective experience. Frequently, her works evoke moments of rupture, chaos, instability, and misunderstanding, but always with the tenuous possibility of repair. And I think if you go actually listen to Declaration, all of that will immediately make sense. Um, Annabelle's work has been shown at the National Museum of Beirut, the Park Avenue Armory in New York, Cave Berlin, the Drawing Room London, and the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, among many other places. The public collections in which her work is represented include the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Manil Collection in Houston, um, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the, I'm going to butcher this, the Vechby Kotz. Uh, <laughs> Koch, the Vechby Koch Foundation in Istanbul, um, the Yale University Art Gallery, and the Ulrich Museum of Art, uh, which acquired Declaration last year. It's part of our collection. Annabelle's creativity is wide-ranging, and her book of fictional prose titled The Autobiography of A will be published later this year, <laughs> or possibly next year. Um, Tonight, Annabelle will give us insights into the path that led her to her current artistic interest in representing multiple perspectives and voices. And from talking to Annabelle over the last couple of days, uh, I've sort of gleaned that this path has included stints in Beirut, New York, Dallas, Paris, and London, among other places. So I think we're all in for a really fascinating story and journey. Um, as usual, Annabelle will speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have um, 15, 20 minutes for Q&A, so get your questions ready. Um, Annabelle will also go into more detail about this, but in case you need to leave early, uh, please uh, come to the performance that she's doing tomorrow at 12.30 in front of Grace Memorial Chapel. It's that plaza between the Radigan Student Center and the chapel. It promises to be a really exciting event. And the last thing I do is thank the organizations uh, that have made our presentation of Annabelle's work possible. So both her exhibition and the associated programs are generously supported in part by a grant from the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission, which receives support from the National Endowment for the Arts, a federal agency. And the Ulrich is as always grateful for the ongoing support of Salon Circle members who make the museum's exhibitions and programs possible through their salon memberships and for general operational support from the city of Wichita and Wichita State University. And with that, I will wrap up my short piece and invite Annabelle up. Thank you. Let me make sure this is, is that good? Okay. Um, thank you so much, and I'm incredibly happy to be here. Um, and I really enjoyed seeing the piece at the uh, chapel. It was really, um, exciting to see it in a place that I didn't intend it to be, so um, uh, yeah, I hope you'll go see it. Uh, 
I also want to acknowledge being in this beautiful exhibition. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to look at these works. Okay. Obsessed, bewildered by the shipwreck of the singular, we have chosen the meaning of being numerous. These are lines from a poem by George Oppen titled, Of Being Numerous, written in 1968. I used to be a painter. In 2003, when, we went, when the US went to war in Iraq, using meaningless mantras and empty language to justify a very brutal military invasion, I had a feeling that there was no place for art. I guess for me at the time that manifested as painting, in the face of what seemed like a society completely emptied of meaning. I had been reading a book of poems by George Oppen with a foreword by the poet Robert Creeley, where he describes how Oppen in 1935 joined the Communist Party and stopped writing. Oppen noted, surely there are situations in which it's absurd to write poetry. One could approach his own death with poetry. I should think one would. But a slaughter, a slaughter for which one bears perhaps some responsibility, or he does what he does. I don't know what one should do. He was suggesting, I guess, that there are times that are too traumatic or distressing for words, for poetry, for art. He didn't write again for 20 years. For me, at that point in my life, I felt that I should stop painting. This is when we went into war in Iraq. And do something else. Something that could take me out of my private space in the studio and out into the world. Of course, throwing away all my paints, which I did, and sitting in an empty room, I realized that I was too far gone. I didn't know how to do or think in any way outside of the process of making art. And so instead of a paintbrush, I took up pencil and paper. And for the next several years, I began making work that consisted of language, transcribed documents, transliterated documents as well. I, I don't know if you know what that is, where I wrote the US Constitution, for example, phonetically in Arabic. So when you read the Arabic writing, you'd be reading English. Um, and, and a very large piece called America that was made up of about 150 documents pertaining to this country. And this is America um, installed at the Park Avenue Armory um, for a big exhibition called um, Democracy in America by Creative Time, which is a, an organizing um, structure in New York that, that, that put, or I guess, across the country. But, um, and this, the whole show was up just in 2008 when the market crashed. So it was kind of a fitting moment for democracy in America. But um, yeah, so, so America for me would be a, a kind of reading, writing of a place. I had just read about Thomas Jefferson's Bible, where he took the Bible right before he died and cut out all the miracles physically. This is actually it. Um, and he called it, basically, he, he called it the life and teachings of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So it's just the story of a person's life with nothing miraculous in it, and he doesn't come back. So, um, and apparently until the 50s in America, um, politicians were sworn in on that Bible. And the reason he did it was he felt that America was going to uh, use Christianity in a, in a negative kind of way, use it, um, you know, uh, I guess he may have turned out to be right in some ways. But um, so what I did was I, um, I hinged together 20 sheets of paper to make a, this, this large sheet, which is 9 by 13 feet. And I began transcribing Thomas Jefferson's Bible across the top. So I was thinking about that as the sky of America. Um, and after that, I started looking at different kinds of ways of structuring it. So the axis, you know, the, the lines are, um, they, they say things like no fly zone, the green line, white picket fence. And then at the bottom, I was um, drawing from uh, descriptions of armies and the army was uh, advertising that if you want to join the army, you could be an army of one. So it says an army of one over and over again. Um, and then there were the names of all the fireworks. Um, there's a description of Louis Kahn talking about how he started building a building. There's um, Simone de Beauvoir who came to New York um, after World War II and she was invited to Vassar by some girls and they said they'd give her a drink and they'd give her milk. 
um, George Washington's call to war, um, I mean, George Bush's call to war and George Washington's farewell address and the CIA fact sheet on America and then music. I mean, I'm just saying a few things. There were about 150 different things and I was really trying to, I was trying to read it as I, you know, I had, I didn't grow up here, so I hadn't really read a lot of the books that people read in high school and stuff. And so a lot of that was actually in there, like just kind of getting to know America. Um, and then in the spring of 2006, Israel was bombing Lebanon and the US was bombing Iraq. And so I was printing out the news every day and transcribing the news into the center. So it felt like that this part, which you're seeing right now around there was the very active part. And then there were other parts that are just transcriptions of poems. And yeah, I think this is the CIA fact sheet. Um, so I wasn't using language as concrete poetry or to create an image with words. Instead, I was reading things I'd never read. It really wasn't about creating an image of space, but an idea of that space, like the sound of an image in some sense. I was thinking of the voices that make up a landscape of a country, the words that structure our memories and our narratives. I was thinking too of who writes the stories we read, and also how did I read this place that I had chosen as my home. The questioning of my relationship to America stayed with me and became pronounced again in 2010 when I was asked to represent the U.S. in the Cairo Biennial. I was representing the U.S. as an American, but also as an Arab American, which was strange for me since I was particularly against the idea of national identities as ways to define art. But I felt that this was an opportunity to address some of these questions about, you know, what it meant to, to represent a country even, um, particularly when you partially come from another country. So, um, so <clears throat> they gave me a lot of funding because it was the US, it was the State Department. So I went between New York and, 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 and Beirut to make this work, which is called From Where to Where. It's a work in two parts. There's a sound element that I, that I can't play, but um, the sound element is composed of English and Arabic responses to the questions, where are you coming from and where are you going to? The questions were posed to random strangers in two cities, New York and Beirut. The paper piece shown here is constructed of postcard-sized pieces of paper on which I responded repeatedly to the question I kept asking myself, where are you now? At first I thought I'd describe where I was, but eventually it became clear to me that the only answer I felt truly comfortable and honest with was, I'm here. Like postcards people send from one place to another, you know, I'm in Paris, I'm here, you know. Um, so kind of as a, as, a, as a way to call out into the world or, you know, across the world, um, your presence. The title of the piece, From Where to Where, is a little tra literal translation of an Arabic expression, min wain la wain, that idiomatically translates as, how dare you? Like, you know, um, where do you come across, I would say, is kind of a similar. Um, the question frames the work as an inquiry into the sense in which identity is asserted, undermined, questioned, and or reconstructed through the ongoing exchange between one's location and one's state of mind. This was the first work I did that contained the voices of many people, which you're not hearing. Strangers across the world, walking up to a stranger in the street to ask a question that in a way broke down the space between us was not easy at first. But there was something really moving and interesting about the interactions. I was asking a very simple question, a question about trajectory and aim. It was a subversion of the question that I often got, where are you from? Much more so when I first came to America. I guess now we all are from a lot of different places. But when I first got here, it, everybody would always ask me that. A question that peop people often use to know how to place you vis-a-vis -vis themselves. Are you different from me? I felt that this was a way to shift the idea of difference. We are all coming and going somewhere together in this work. In that given moment of the question on the street corner, we are here together. The work was exhibited at the 12th annual Cairo Biennial, which opened two weeks before the outbreak of the Egyptian revolution in Tahrir Square. It remained at the Palace of Arts in Cairo throughout the uprising. And although few people ended up seeing it, I did feel that it echoed the cry of the people who were out in Tahrir Square together and alone. I'm here. It ends up looking a little bit kind of like the shape of Tahrir Square too. Um, it was the idea of the revolutions we watched, 
we watch on our screens that drew me to thinking about screens and the communication they enable, but also the barriers they form. As someone who grew up in a war where the electricity was cut so often and the telephones didn't work, old electronics, telephones, televisions, always held a fascination for me. The mystery on the other side of the screen, other end of the line, transmitters which seem to have another side or an interior. Also the question of where we stand vis-a-vis -vis the screen, which side are we really on? In 2012, I began walking through the streets of New York and asking people randomly and with no context, explanation or preparation, which side are you on? The work was not initially motivated by the Occupy movement, since I had conceived of the project months before. But by the time I went out to, in the street, Zuccotti Park in Lower Manhattan near my studio was occupied, and so many of the responses became inflected, inflected with what was happening at the time. After Zuccotti Park was closed, it was astounding to me how quickly the responses shifted. As the Super Bowl came into view quite soon after, the questions went from the big picture of the system being called into question to the safe zone of rooting for the Giants. This is the resulting work, which is actually the television. Um, this is a video of the video, the television, and it plays um, this audio. And it, there's a confessional screen um, the video is of a confessional screen with, with somebody vaguely moving behind it. It's hard to see that, so I'm just explaining it. But I'll play a piece of it right now. It's, it's about four minutes, and I'll play a minute. Which side are you on? Your side. The upside. I'm with the underdogs. Which side, Which side are you on? For, for the others. Uh, the women's side. <laughs> Clearly not the majority. Which side are you on? It's very hard to choose right and wrong. Not on the side of the war. Not the radical. Like, oh, I'm on the inside or the outside. Which side are you on? I just said there's no two sides. There's many, many voices to be heard. Which side are you on? The side of love. The right side, the good side. This, that, or the other. Which side are you on? Both sides. The right side. That's a very big question. During this period, I began to think about the accumulation of voices, of language as a way to mark a sense of being in the same place as others. The idea of the power of repetition as markers of being and also forms of engagement that I could bring into my performative practice that had something to do with the street or the public space. There was an element of street or guerrilla journalism in From Where to Where and Which Side Are You On? Just actively walking up to people randomly and sticking a microphone in their face. Um, Which maybe side it was are you this. On? Sorry. Oh, it's going to play it again. All right. Which side are you on? Your side. The yep. other Maybe it was this interest in what takes place at the level of the street that led me to become interested in fortune tellers and the gendered and other position that they inhabit. I've almost never gone to a fortune teller myself, but I became interested in, in them. <laughs> fortune telling is ubiquitous in urban life, even though it is illegal in many places, including New York City, where it's a class B misdemeanor. In the depths of Dante's Inferno, the fortune tellers walk with their heads on backwards, punished for presuming to see the future. You can advertise yourself as a psychic, but not as a fortune teller. I was thinking about the fortune teller as a stand-in for the artist, someone who looks at the present in order to see the past and to project the future. Someone who holds some power, but who is also a hustler and a seducer, calling you to put, out your hand, put, to put your hands out, to pay them, and also to give some part of yourself to get something you want. Considered in a social and historical context, the figure of the fortune teller raises questions about superstition and belief, as well as class, gender, and cross-cultural interaction. The fortune teller is at once a subject of suspicion and someone in whom trust is precariously placed. She is a dealer in the underground economy of desire and expectation. In 2013, I began my ongoing project, Fortune. 
In this project, members of the public are solicited to partake in an intimate exchange in which they present their palms and receive their fortunes transcribed onto paper for $10. The reading and writing is entirely silent. It is structured around two questions, where are you coming from and where are you going to? The fee changes the project from a performance to an exchange. There is payment for what the artist gives, for the artist's labor, but there's an expectation from the participant in a very different kind of way, since they're owed something. They're not just giving you their time for a performance. They expect you to do something good or that they want. Um, I have done fortune now in multiple places across the world, in institutions, galleries, parks, and in the street. In 2017, I rented a window space in Lower Manhattan for several months. I put the word fortune in the window, um, and I didn't frame it as an art project. And most of the people who came, by, came in were passers-by. So as an art project, I might have been able to get away with it as, as not a crime, but to run this for five months in Manhattan with fortune in the window is actually a crime. And um, it was really enjoyable, I have to say, to <laughs> Um, to be breaking the law in New York. Um, I sign the fortunes AD, I sign all my work AD, um, and I date them, and that, that's all, you know, that's the only, uh, so when people took them, um, they didn't necessarily think of it as an artwork. I like the fact that hundreds of people have a work of mine that's made solely for them, though. The process of sitting across from a stranger whose hands are outstretched for five to 10 minutes wordlessly is both intense and meaningful. I don't look up at people's faces, and what I do is I write a line of text for a line in their hands. Um, and I find it really interesting how few people have really looked at their own hands for 10 minutes, at their own palms for 10 minutes. Um, yeah. So in 2018, Temporary Art Platform, which is a public art platform in Lebanon, commissioned artists to do projects that would appear in the daily newspapers. My work was an ad in the Daily Star asking people to send me an image of their hands. I wrote their fortunes and they were printed in the paper anonymously, so people had to recognize their own hands in order to be able to read their fortune. Temporary Art Platform, which is run by Amanda Abi Khalil, um, then invited me to, do a work, to, to work on a project titled Madhaf Madhaf, which means museum, museum. The idea was to have contemporary artists create a work that referenced the main museum in Lebanon, the National Museum of Beirut, which houses archaeological art artifacts, in anticipation of a contemporary art museum projected to be built across the street from the National Museum. So they were, I mean, who knows whether any of this will ever happen, but at the time there was an excitement around this. So this is how Amanda Abi Khalil, the curator who produced the project, described the multi-layered associations of the word madhaf. In the context of contemporary Beirut, the word madhaf, museum in Arabic, has numerous associations and connotations, which tend to vary depending on a given person's sociological background or cultural tastes and practices. For some, madhaf could refer to the geolo geographical location, the area between Badaro, Sodoko, and the Hippodrome racetrack. For others, the madhaf marks a central point in Beirut's political map, the demarcation line during the Civil War, also known as Museum Alley which separated the armies and several militias. For working class commuters, it is an access point to work. It is the roundabout intersection where you can catch a shared cab ride. And it is a stop for the micro bus line, which links the popular residential neighborhoods of Dota and Barbir. For local residents or street food connoisseurs, the area is famous for the sandwich place, Snack Al Madhaf. It is important to note that the number of local visitors to museums in Lebanon remains very low, mainly due to the absence of a nationally-led cultural policy or education and outreach programs, and thus very few residents in the city will associate the Madhaf, first and foremost, with the National Museum of Beirut. The National Museum of Beirut was renovated in the 90s, but to so many people like me who lived in Beirut during the Civil War in the late 70s and 80s, the word Madhaf conjures a place of extreme violence and fear, and much of the, the area around there is still pockmarked, um, and the museum has a huge hole in one of its uh, mosaics. Um, 
it's actually terrifying to look at what the museum actually ended up looking like after the, the war. And they've done an incredible job with it. Um, this was my first real art project in Lebanon. I had always been hesitant to make work there. Somehow it always seemed to me that there was no space for art for me emotionally in a country that ravaged so many people's lives, including my own family. But somehow I felt that this was a way for me to deal with those feelings for once. Because the museum is a place of extreme bureaucracy and under the jurisdiction of the government, if you can call the corrupt cronies who run the country a government, there was no way that you could al they would allow us to put any object or installation in the museum. Their intention was for people to make work about the museum, which eventually would be in the Contemporary Art Museum. Um, but I decided <laughs> that I would invite the people of Beirut into the museum to talk about and give voices to the object in the collection from their present perspective and referencing their own experiences. The work took the form of an audio guide and they eventually let us put it in the museum as an alternate audio guide, so we, we got in there. Um, we invited people from all walks of life. We contacted different groups and put up posters all over the city and literally walked around in front of the city inviting people in. In fact, the guard got really into it and he would go down with his gun down the steps and tell people, come in, come in and see, <laughs> see what's happening. And, and they would come because, but um, they were happy afterwards. We walked through the museum in groups of five. Most people didn't know each other. There was a performative element to the workshops, and I would walk people through the same route and ask the same questions in a kind of performative way, actually. And then we would record their answers. I chose to do it solely in Arabic, which is not the language of art or education in Lebanon, but it's the language of many people who joined us. And although I did get pushback from the museum because they kept telling me that so many of their visitors were foreign and no one would understand it, I willfully wanted to make a work by and for the people of Beirut. Many of the people who came in had no idea that this building housed elements of their own history. That was what shocked many of them, actually. Many walked by thinking it was a bank or a government building. In Lebanon, there are archaeological objects everywhere you turn. The country is old and in ruins in very many ways. <laughs> Um, when my parents dug for the foundation of our building that they built, um, they found a sarcophagus which my mother planted geraniums in. So when people encountered these objects in the museum, there was a kind of reference for being in this museum, but they were also very much at ease with the objects. I mean, right outside the museum was a sarcophagus filled with garbage and Pepsi Cola cans and whatever, and inside it was up on a pedestal. So it kind of allowed them to speak kind of freely. <laughs> The participatory audio reverses the traditional way an audience engages with the museum collection and brings together a myriad of voices, my voice, which was often silenced, and the responses of participants, as well as two recurring voices of professional actors we hired, um, who I wrote narrations for them that were kind of semi-funny, but also took on the structure of formality so that it would sound like a real audio guide. Um, and then a year later, I, I did a show in Berlin, and I put together this video, which I'll show you now, with subtitles in English. And the images are images I took in the museum with my iPhone, thinking a lot about how we see work in museums really through our own iPhones. So it's kind of like the way that we see it as visitors and not as the institution. I think it is a new generation, a new generation, which I took and put me, but I gave it to you. للعالم الجديدة انه شو بتعمل الحرب بالانسان انا ما انكسرت في حدا كسرني اكيد بحس حالي اني مظلوم حل ما انا موجودة بهيدا البلد مش حاسة حالي وحطوني هون بالمطرح يعني هيك متوازنة ومستقرة كنت مخبى وقشت ازيفة امي مش حاسة بامان على البيت عما امي وبي ماتوا بس انا تشوهت عشت بس عشت مشوه انا يلي بغير الطريقه يلي انتم بتشوفوني فيها وقت اللي انا اطلع عليكم لقيت خلقان بلا عيون امي لبنانيه بس بي مش لبناني امي ما فيها تعطيني جنسيه هلا بفتكر انا ما في احكي بقى آه لانه انا صرت هون بس تمثيل بس بقدر ساعد الناس من ورا شكل اللي صار من بعد الحرب فيني شاهد ايه بالحكي على الاشياء اللي شفتها من قبل كنت انا موجود من قبل اكيد فيني خبر شو وصلت الحرب اخر شيء وشو عملت الحرب اخر شيء بس انا احكي هون او اتحرك لانه انا صرت هون مثل بس وش ميت بس بلا روح وبلا جسد كثير خلقت من زمان وبعدني عايش بس وجهي اللي باقي مني 
عم تكذب علي؟ اه ايه هي الأميرة وهو صاحب القصر أو شيء العلاقة بين هول الأشخاص أحباب اثنين يعني بحبوا بعضهم هن بحسوا حالهم إنه أعلى من كل العالم هيئته كثير بارد وهي كمان مش قاشعيننا هيئتهم مش شايفيننا حدا بيعرف بقلب التاني شو فيه لا يفكروا علي ما بيعرفوني أكيد بكون مبسوطة أكثر منهم عم يطلعوا بحدا بدهم ينتقموا منه عم يطلعوا بعيد كثير سوري أنا بفتكر At the end of 2019 I was awarded a Paula Krasner residency at the International Studio and Curatorial Program in Brooklyn Citizen was the first work I made there Being around all these different artists from countries around the world, I was thinking about borders and how in some ways they were being reinforced, but in other ways they were dissolving. Citizen is a mental, physical mapping of all the sovereign countries in the world. Um, there are only about, I think, 275 or something like that. Um, completed at the very beginning of 2020, it was meant to question our place with respect to each other across moving and abstract boundaries. It was a way for me to express my sense that a place is not a fixed entity. I would never have imagined the unbridgeable national borders, how unbridgeable national borders would become just a few months later when you could no longer even get on a plane or go anywhere. The next work I began after Citizen was a work that eventually led to the piece that's installed in the Grace Memorial Chapel. Um, the work takes its opening line, it, it takes its title from the opening line of the Declaration of Independence of 1776, when in the course of human events. Reappropriated, the words become a universal template for articulating the pivotal moment when one is moved to act. I ask people to complete the line, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary to. Everyday expressions are interspersed with lines borrowed from or gifted by artists, poets, writers, and activists. Cumulatively, these words express a sense of urgency in the face of global disturbances that have, been, that have drawn into question the viability of the prevailing econo political economic order. The work began in response to the multitude of protests across the world and the sense that the street was alive with rejection of how things were. I wanted the piece to, not, to, to be not an answer or a judgment about the situation, but instead to reflect the multitude the individual and shared understanding that a moment of necessity to act had been reached in a particular life at a particular point in time. And Declaration, the piece in the chapel, is, is a sound piece <clears throat> that merges my voice reciting the language from the scroll, but in the first person. So this says, um, when in the course of human events it nece becomes necessary to expand your imagination beyond capitalist realism, to wave a white flag, to fold your arms, to clench your fists, to exchange parting gifts. And declaration is, I wave a wet red flag, I expand my imagination, I know when to stop. Um, yeah, and, but also with the sound of day-to-day -day life in New York and the sound of um, protests and chants across the world. I worked on it with a sound artist from Berlin, her name is Miriam Schickler, and she was recording elements of her life as well. And then a friend in Beirut, Rania Jabbar, was sending me recordings every day of marching in the street in the Thoto, the revolution that was happening in Lebanon at the time. Um, the many voices from the scroll, or the many entries from the scroll of people, as well as these interactions, and exchanges highlight my interest in the oscillation between the individual and the collective, the friend and the stranger. While the scroll presents a moment when there is a realization, realization that a shift or a turn or a detour is necessary, declaration is a move towards a sense of responsibility. So much has occurred in the world since this piece was made. I hear in my own voice the attempt to have courage. Also the tenuous and tenuousness and confusion when faced with the almost endless possibilities.
In voicing the text in the present, there is a sense that I am performing, but also that I'm directing myself. And I'm going to play a, a minute of the sound piece, which is 24 minutes. And um, there's a scroll here that gives you some of the text so that you can see it. I take a step back. I take a deep breath. I hold out my hands. I hold back my tears. I scream in the night. I wait for the dawn. I wait for the dawn. I take to the streets. I take to the streets. I run for the hills. I run for the hills. I loosen my grip. I, I loosen my, my grip. I lighten my load. I shoulder the burden. I break up the fight. I howl at the moon. I leave nothing behind. I save what I can. I mess, I mess it, all, it all, up. all up. I tear it all down. I take what I want. I take what is mine. I give what I have. I lay down my arms. I take off my mask. I stare at the sun. I aim for the stars. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I wonder how it got to this. It's interesting. I just noticed I take off my mask. We hear it differently now, but I think it referred to the Hong Kong protesters, actually. Um, whoever sent it to me, I guess they were, it was something like that, the tear gas or something. So it's kind of, I don't think we'll ever hear that again the same way, but. Um, uh, over the course of the same year, I do hope everybody will go and listen to the, the sound piece. I, I, as I said before, it was really interesting for me to hear it in a chapel because it, it actually, I had wanted it to feel like a journey through a day in someone's life. That's why it's kind of 24 minutes. So I really wanted it to be something that you could just walk into and walk out of. And in the chapel, it really does, uh, I think, feel that way. Um, so over the course of the same year, I was running a temporary exhibition project in the lobby of a building I lived in in, in Brooklyn. I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, sorry. Um, together with another artist, we would invite artists to occupy the lobby with their work or a performance once a month on a Sunday afternoon. It was a building on the south side of Williamsburg in Brooklyn where families had lived for decades. We were thinking about the lobby as a public space where one could leave furniture um, while they were moving or stop and chat with a neighbor or pick up their mail. Um, you know, any way people use a lobby. It belonged to everyone and no one. And so when we invited artists to set up their work, we specified use it like a lobby. So don't, you know, don't alter anything and don't leave anything behind. Um, these projects were pretty joyous actually and people would pass through the lobby between two and six on a Sunday, um, and then come up to our apartment to eat and drink. And we ran the lobby for over a year, <clears throat> and then I was ready to do a project myself. And I planned a relay where for 12 hours people would pace the lobby with someone else's concern on their minds, and then they would be able to voice their own concern to the person who replaced them, and so on. And it was kind of based on the idea, you know, I mean, I guess, I, I, I had started making these, or I started making these worry beads, um, and I was thinking, oh, you know, of the of the way my father. We lived. We had a hallway in Beirut, which is where everybody always ended up. We lived there during the war, really, because it was the safest place. And I just remember my father um, walking back and forth, and all these men walking back and forth with their worry beads. And again, I, as I was saying previously, I'm interested in these gendered roles that you know, um, in the imagination are kind of, we attach them to somebody. So I always think of the men walking down the hallway um, in, in Beirut. Um, so anyway, uh, I planned it for March of 2020, but of course it gradually got canceled because of COVID. Um, it was really bad in New York in March, and uh, as everyone knows. So it st slowly started to degenerate. First of all, people started calling me and saying, you know this thing, maybe, we could, maybe you could have like, uh, you know, alcohol to wipe things. I mean, now it seems normal, but remember at the time it was like, how can you find that? And, and then they were saying, well, maybe you could have different worry beads for everybody. And then they were like, and it slowly kind of degenerated. So finally, I figured instead of having a relay, between different individuals, I would just ask them to send me their worries, the people who chose to participate, and I would do the whole walk myself. Um, and I would walk from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, and the thought was, is that's the time people worry the most. So I thought, well, I'll take on people's worries for that period of time. 
Um, the thought of pacing the long lobby seemed actually doable during lockdown, but then it became kind of scary. There were a lot of old people in the building and, and I felt like they'd think that I was keeping vigil or something and that would, and also I didn't want to be in public space. So I decided to do it in the hallway of my apartment, um, which is not a very big hallway. And I did it three times. I did it in March of 2020 and then in April of 2020 and then later the next year. But um, in the April version, my galleries in New York and Berlin, um, Tanya Wagner and Signs and Symbols, they, they, uh, they decided to live stream it on Instagram and they sent out a request. So I got all kinds of responses from people I didn't know. Um, and, and what was interesting is how much more vulnerable and profound the next round of worries were. I mean, the first round, a lot of it was, will we have PPE, will we, or, you know, will we have uh, toilet paper? I mean, it was very basic and, and, um, and I'll say this because I'm saying this now, the progression in the projects that I've done um, have, there's, there's so much more vulnerability than there was four, five years ago, so much more honesty and so much more less ironic, snappy answers, you know, like being funny, <laughs> which, I, which I got a lot of when I first, you know, did stuff in the street, people would try to be smart. People don't seem to want to be smart that much anymore, but um, uh, yeah, so, so I titled the, the performance, um, I Will Worry For You From Dusk Till Dawn. Um, and the way it worked is I asked people to send along with their worries, they would choose a time on a timesheet that I shared with them, and that way they could watch on the live stream when I was worrying for them specifically. So there was a lot of kind of intensity feeling that, you know, they were there with me. Um, and it was entirely silent, so the worries were anonymous. Um, I'm going to show you, so, um, so I walked for 12 hours nonstop, there was a tiny, I would break and you'll see, this is the very first minute and a half of the first, of one of the 12 hour walks. Um, and I, I would pick up the paper that had the time on it and the worry. And I would kind of look at it and think about it. And then I'd get up and I'd write the time on the wall because each set of worry beads, there are 12 of them. Um, each one held four walks because I gave each person 15 minutes. So I'd have one set of worry beads for an hour and I'd mark on the wall um, the time just so I knew how many I had done with each one as I moved through it. That was a minute and a half, so can you imagine 12 hours? <laughs> it, was, it was pretty boring to watch, I imagine, but um, it, 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 it's strangely, uh, it's, it strangely didn't feel that long as I did it in, in some ways, I guess, because I had committed to doing it, and so it's a very different kind of feeling when you decide to do that, but, um, you know, because you know you can't stop, and people are kind of, uh, well, they're with you, so th there's that. 
Um, and I was thinking of the string of worry beads in a way represents our connections to each other. As, as my hand moved, they would tap each other lightly, allowing for a sense of touch and connection at a time when I think none of, you know, many of us didn't feel that we had one. <laughs> Um, I did it one last time in February of 2021, and it was live streamed um, by, by performative screenings, uh, which is in, in Vienna, and um, they were in lockdown again. And so this is just so you see what it looked like on in Instagram for people to watch, so they, they people could watch it through their windows because they couldn't come inside. Um, and uh, again, it was all it was always from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m because that's the time people worry most, I think, maybe. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I've been interested in certain roles that have historically been the work of women. Fortune telling was one, but also wailing, crying women from history. The Worry Project had something to do with this concept, the idea that one could perform the sorrow or the concern of people that they didn't know, and that in some way they could relieve the person or have them feel some sense of solidarity from that person. This thinking also indirectly informed my next project, which I made during the bleakest days of the lockdown and through the rest of 2020. I think because I grew up in a country <clears throat> at war, I'm very conscious about how bigger so-called newsworthy events affect individuals on the ground. I'm interested in what is deemed important and to whom, and how events change us or affect us, and what scale of event matters to us or has power to move us. Um, a Year Like Any Other was an exhibition at my gallery in Berlin, Tanya Wagner. Um, it consists of 12 works on paper, each based on a month of the year, and a video work called A Year Like Any Other. It's structured around 365 events that occurred somewhere in the world over the course of a year. Together, these works chart the body moving through time and grappling with the physical and emotional spaces that constrain it. I began the project by scanning the news and the lists of events taking place throughout the world. And I was struck by the fact that um, a bus drives off a cliff somewhere in the world almost every day. I mean, it's shocking how many awful things happen somewhere every day. And I was also thinking about history in years past and old stories and other wars. In the works on paper, the threads of day-to-day -day life ramify into networks of fleeting moments. The surfaces are fabric-like, dyed in white ink, and cut and held together with mending tissue. The forms and the way in which the language, language hovers around them allude to the Egyptian wall drawings of weeping women, as well as early medical drawings known as wound men. They're produced through a sequence of dance-like movements in which the paper is sliced through, pulled apart, and reassembled. The pieces hang in a tenuous balance. I wanted them to suggest both fragility and resilience. In the video work, the body is by turns constricted and set free. The inside becomes outside as the world breaks in through scrims and screens and the piercing sounds of sirens and slashing of helicopter blades. At the time, I was trying to learn a communal dance alone, the Debki, which is a Lebanese dance um, that I never learned, and so I thought this would be an interesting time to do it. But it was without anyone to hook my arms in, and there was no lead to follow, so I was dancing with other people by myself. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I kept asking myself, what remains of a year? The marks on a wall, fragments of disparate events, residues of class and power, and whatever's left behind is the story that remains. So it's obviously not the whole story ever. Um, but this is uh, January. Um, this is the video, A Year Like Any Other, and this is the month of January. January 1, a million protesters take to the streets. January 2, a man who was making art dies. January 3, a drone strike kills a general. January 4, an invitation to an exhibition is received. January 5, a man recalls a photograph he took of a young woman once. January 6, a prolific serial rapist is sentenced to life in prison. January 7, a stampede takes place at a general's funeral. January 8, a plane is shot down shortly after takeoff. January 9, a rare circumbinary planet is discovered. January 10, a group of friends attend an art opening. January 11, a hundred-year-old tortoise retires to the wild. January 12, a volcano erupts and thousands are evacuated. January 13, a man dies in prison after a hunger strike. January 14, 
a contribution of $2.70 is made to a political campaign. January 15, a mutiny is quelled by armed forces. January 16, a trial to impeach a politician begins. January 17, an artist meets a friend for coffee at a former dance club. January 18, a drone strike kills 80 military personnel. January 19, a blizzard causes several deaths from hypothermia. January 20, a country honors a man who was assassinated. January 21, a country announces its first case of a virus. January 22, a report says that a massive fire has killed one billion animals. January 23, a city is sealed off to prevent the spread of a virus. January 24, a citywide protest calls for the withdrawal of an occupying army's troops. January 25, a photograph is taken of a rainbow arching over a building. January 26, an athlete dies in a helicopter crash. January 27, an infected man is placed in an isolation ward. January 28, a peace plan is signed by two corrupt politicians. January 29, an officer is charged with murder for shooting a man whose hands were cuffed. January 30, a public health emergency of international concern is declared. January 31, a kingdom and an island formally withdraw from the Union. January is interesting for me because I started the project sometime in late February as things began to happen. So January is the one that was done retrospectively. Um, and uh, eventually a virus becomes the virus. And all of the sentences, I don't know if you noticed, all the sentences begin with A. So the structure of it is, and I was thinking a lot about again, what, what we leave behind in ta time capsules, but just also in history, what are the residue of, of a given time and how do we specify what that time was? Because for us, every day is very specific, but in history, we're looking at things at a certain kind of bigger period of time. When we find objects, we allocate them to, to a period and not to the specific and, you know, um, <sighs> very prescribed time that, that matters to us now. So I was kind of trying to, I was trying to get a feeling of, of this, this open-ended, um, this open-ended moment that, that that period was. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm gonna come to a close here. I'm leaving, um, uh, Wichita tomorrow to go to Dallas for the opening of my show, Gods and Grifters. And I'll close with a piece called Another Country, which is about the scale of the first work I showed, America. Um, and it's made of microfiber paper again, but this time the paper, I, I've cut, cut the paper to, um, to leave the language behind. And then I take, it's, it's, this white microfiber paper and then I pour ink on it and the ink pools and it's very intense and then it dries and it has a kind of feeling of, of, um, of worn copper or bare branches after, after they dry in the sun. So the intensity then shifts to this kind of chalky, um, kind of stony residue. And I was thinking a lot, I've been thinking a lot about stone recently and about um, Mesopotamian and Babylonian uh, stone carvings where there's a kind of repetitive cutting into the stone to list different things. And so I, I was thinking um, while I'm making these works of paper and while they're suspended and light, I was actually thinking about, about stone. Um, another is an interesting word. It denotes both the repetition of the same as in I'll have another and the possibility for something different or something other than what is as in another world is possible. There are 16 years between America, the first work I showed, um, which was made in 2006, and another country which I completed a few weeks ago. And I look at the text now and I wonder, I wonder if I would choose the same texts. So much has been exposed, uncovered, revealed, and given voice, both in the world and in my small circle. And Lately, I've been reflecting on, um, I mean, I show these works to talk about how I, uh, how I integrate interactions with 
my community, but also with the greater community into my work, it's something that um, has been a progression for me. And the more I do it, the more I feel a kind of uh, a need to do more. I feel that it's a way to, to give my work place. I feel like I need to do it in order to give my work place. That's, that's, you know, it's a personal thing about how you carve out place for your own work. So this is how I do that. Um, but I've also been thinking about, as I said, how we've changed in the way that res we respond to each other, the way that we respond to these questions that I ask. Um, and it feels to me that there is more openness um, and also more acceptance of feeling confused and being honest about that. So um, lately I've been thinking about the question that I think, questions that I think we all ask ourselves, what can I do, what should I do, what will I do? And like Oppen said early on, <laughs> I don't know what one should do. So um, I'm inviting people, I've been inviting people to, um, to send me responses to that and tomorrow uh, I, I'll be reading them. And this is a QR code that you can use right now if you'd like to, so that if you'd like to send them. I'm planning to accumulate this. It's beginning here and I'm planning to keep accumulating these. So even if you send it not in time um, for tomorrow, uh, I will add it to the next time. And it's entirely anonymous. So uh, please feel free to say <laughs> whatever you want to say. Um, and I hope, I hope you'll join me tomorrow and ask me any questions. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, Greg. Um, does anyone have any questions for Annabelle? He, oh, sorry. So what piece of advice would you give to your younger artists? Uh, to my younger artist? You mean to me as a younger artist? To other uh, younger artists. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say that it's important to build a community and that it's important for the community not to just be people that you went to the same art school with or make the same kind of work as. I think it's important to build a community based on mutual understanding or learning from each other. My closest friends I, you know, that I run projects with in New York, um, they make work that's not like mine at all, actually, but we're very, very close and we're able to do projects together because we respect each other. Sometimes we don't even like each other's work as much as other people like <laughs> our, our work, but, but that's really not what it's about. I think, I think for me, I personally think we have to all be trying to build something that's a little bit stronger than what we have now so that it can hold us when we feel vulnerable, but also so that we build a base to, to, to build something on. So if you ask as a younger artist, I would try to form, it's not friendships exactly, but understanding with other people. And also, you know, one of the things that I've ended up doing a lot with uh, people is when there aren't projects or when things are bad or when whatever, we start them ourselves. Like what we, you know, what we did in the lobby was incredibly fun, but I've done a lot of things like that over my life. And, and you know, sometimes I've done it when I'm super busy and I have a lot of other things, but I still do it wholeheartedly because I feel like, um, not even just to give opportunity to other people, because not, that's not just what it's about. It's about giving, forcing myself, forcing yourself to actually be engaged and to actually follow through and to also see what it's like to do that. Because, you know, we come to museums and we come to things and we don't actually recognize that a lot of the people who are, who are doing this work are actually kind of people like us who, you know, like artists, I think, in the sense that they actually want art to be in the world and they're doing what they can to make that happen. Um. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, 
I have a question that is based off of, you know, what you've presented for us today. It may not be completely accurate, but it seems as though your work that you've shown in Lebanon is based on historic grappling with history, whereas much of your work that you show in the United States is based on sort of posi positionality. And again, I don't know if that's truly accurate, um, but I'm curious what the distinctions are for you between the work that you show in the US and the work that you show and you do and construct in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, um, I think there, are, there are issues about place that you can't get away from. I mean, it's really interesting with the Lebanon project because I took a lot of people through there. I mean, I grew up during the war in Lebanon, but a lot of the people that I was taking through they, they hadn't, there were even younger kids. I mean, this is before the explosion that happened in August, I don't know if you know, and, and COVID and all of that. So now it's terrible again, but there was a period where it was kind of okay. And, and still people would answer about war and still they'd answer about, you know, trauma and stuff like that. So I'm saying that to say that I think it's kind of hard sometimes in a given place to get away from certain things, particularly when you deal in some of the issues that I'm interested in, which is what remains and language and um, and also place. You know, I, I noticed as I wrote this that I ask where you're coming from and where you're going to a lot. It's in, I, honestly, I just noticed it now that it's in my fortune. It's in my. I never realized how much I do that. And it's interesting for somebody like me who's kind of against identity, like I don't actually use, I, it, in response to your question too, when I came to America in the 80s, being a woman and being from Lebanon was not at all interesting. And there were no doors open for that. There was, you know, it was Julian Schnabel was, you know, it was, just to say, it was white men artists. And there was really no interest really in people from places like like Lebanon, that was so. <clears throat> but that, but that's not the case now, and that's great. That's really wonderful. But, it, but I am who I am, also. So I probably negotiate that. But when I got here, I really just wanted to be an artist. You know, not a woman, not a Lebanese, not an American. And I guess, like we were talking earlier, you know, you walk a tightrope trying to figure out your way in this, and you are you know, in the end, you are what you are, you're also what people see you. I don't know if I answered what you asked me, but the thing is I haven't really done that many projects in Lebanon, actually, you know, I've only done um, that project and, and really one other one, you know, um, so maybe it's that, maybe it was that encounter with a place that I, I had never considered a place to make art. <laughs> Okay, okay, good. What things were you thinking about during those 12 hours in your apartment walking? And what motivated you to keep walking for those 12 hours? Well, so people would send me their worries. And it's an interesting question that you're asking me because how do you worry for someone you don't know? And also, um, is can you you know can you really take on somebody's concern particularly somebody like me who has a very big family and lots of whatever and i'm always trying to fix every, everything for everybody and one of the things i learned in that is that um and i tried different methods one of the things i would do is i would repeat the person's worry in my head like a mantra you know i'm worried about my father i'm worried whether he'll get surgery i'm worried whether he'll get out of the hospital i'm worried about my father you know that the other thing I did was I considered carrying the worry. I would think, okay, this is an object. I'm carrying this worry for a little while so that maybe the other person for a minute can let it down, you know, and, and, and uh, those were the things. One of the other things I thought about was you can't fix it for her or him or whoever. Like, I'm worried that I won't get my visa. Oh, well, maybe I could tell her that, you know, if she didn't do this, she could do that. And, that was a lot of work actually because I the immediate thought is to fix and that's actually not sharing somebody's worry you know even somebody you know I, I've been learning that a lot 
but it's almost like therapy. But I've been, but it's been good for my life in general because I realize, you know, you can be with a person, you can be there for a person. It's kind of what I call solidarity in art. You know, you can be in solidarity without fixing it and without taking it on in a way that, you know, it be, makes it yours. You can just be there with the person. So it was that. I, I think. <laughs> Early in your talk, you spoke of the translating to the phonetic, or I don't, you used a word that I wasn't familiar with. Uh, when you did that translation, were there any meanings that popped out to you? Anything from your the the native language that gave a poetic verse or a different way of looking at the words? So. Um What's interesting about it is we use transliteration a lot more now with texting, for example, like people transliterate, like I, when I text with people in Arabic, it's using English letters. So what I did with this was, it was, you know, it was right after 9-11 and um, there was this kind of feeling like you see Arabic and all of a sudden it's terrorist. And I was like, okay, this is and the Constitution and America and America and all of that. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be hilarious if I actually, I mean, it, it almost came out of humor and then it became hard to do. So then it became art. It's almost like, a, but I, I, uh, I, I wanted people to see Arabic and then if they could read it, they'd be reading English. So basically it said, we the people of the United States. If, literally, if you read the Arabic, you were simply reading English, but using Arabic letters. So it's called transliteration. It's phonetic, basically. But except for people who speak English and Arabic, nobody could read it because an Arabic speaking person would immediately try to find the word that it was, like what you're saying. So probably there were a lot of real words in there. You know, if you were reading it in, if you only spoke Arabic, you probably would have found, um, but it was hard for me because I speak both. So I was kind of, the whole time I was writing, I was like, okay, does, which letter will work to sound that out, you know? So, did, did, is that clear? was that clear yet? Um, yeah. Josh. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I felt like there was this tension that ran through it around the position of the artist in society. Like you started with the story of this fellow whose name I forget, um, who around 1968 decided that like he had to be, I guess, active in the movements that were going on at the time, and then came back to art later. Um, and then the art that you showed, um, like empathy and a desire for intimacy and vulnerability and sort of a sensitivity to the um, pain going on in the world sort of was, I picked that up as a sort of a theme. I'm wondering if, if you feel that tension that the fellow at the beginning felt and the degree to which that anim sort of animates your work as an artist, the tension between sort of observing with sensitivity um, the pain going on in the world and wanting to act in, in some way. Yeah. Um, well, he, he actually, he was writing until 1935, and then he stopped writing in 35 as the war started, and he joined the army, actually, at, and, but he started writing again in 68, which is when he wrote, or like 20 years around that time, but he was always active, and exactly what you're saying, he just decided, I have to do something, so he joined the army, even though he was actually not, you know, he was a nonviolent person, but he felt he had to do um, something. I have spent my whole life feeling like, is it really okay to be making art? And periodically, I've kind of, you know, tried to stop, like when I stopped painting after we went into Iraq. And that's why I begin the story with that, because I was a painter for a long time. I painted every single day of my life almost. I was explaining my mom had six kids in the middle of a war. If anybody could do anything, she'd have them do it every day just to get them out of the way. So she forced me to paint and draw every day. So. It was the only thing I really knew how to do or felt, you know, that I could use to address anything, you know, in my life. I did, I did try to stop, really, periodically, I did. Um, and, and, I, and I did volunteer for a lot of politicians, you know, I did try to do work on the ground and um, I did mutual aid in New York. I, you know, I tried to actually 
not just be saying that we need to do something, but I think they're very, very different things. And one of the things I've kind of discovered, I don't know if that this is true, and I think it's a complicated thing, what you get and what you give when you do the projects kind of that I do, like, like Fortune, like this project, you know, tomorrow. Um, I've started to feel like maybe it's okay that it might give people a little moment to be heard, a little moment to be with other people, and a sense that we kind of, like I was saying earlier, that we're slightly trying to build on the idea of not even just empathy, but solidarity, really, you know? And, and I can do this. This I can do. I can still do other things, and I think I should, but I'm slowly um, more and more starting to feel like I can separate this to those two things and not constantly hurt myself in feeling like I'm not doing enough because I actually think holding a space open for art more and more, I think if we don't, then, then you know, what are we really? Like, why, why isn't this as valid as anything else? I mean, you know, why is becoming a politician more valid than, you know, and, I used to think, okay, be a doctor, but, you know, doctors need artists to, you know, they're using art for healing a lot now, because in the end, it's not that we do something so amazing, but we actually just do something, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, um, or it's taken me a long time <laughs> to be able to say that, but thank you for asking me that question. Does anyone have another question? Grad students in the back? No? All right, thank you, Annabelle. Oh, thank you. It's a lovely talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.